But uh, our next presenter is uh, David Rossi. David Rossi has so kindly provided us with these books on the table. So David uh, is an author, a consultant, an adventurer, facilitator. His award-winning approach has led dedicated teams to achieve national recognition and a high level of success working with youth. Once again, when we asked last year what, in our steering committee, what do you guys want to see? We said an aging workforce, a lot of young workers coming into the uh, into industry, so how do we mentor those, those uh, young workers? So teaching common sense and critical thinking, he couples his training with a variety of workshops to build essential skills, with developed strategies to retain young workers, managers, and supervisors, engaging workshops and before the first day. Worker training paired with mentoring programs and facilitation customized to the unique needs of employers. He's got a forestry and consultation to tourism and boat building. His knowledge with wide range of industries brings insight to teams working with new and young workers. Operating Common Sense Center, he delivers training workshops and programs locally and nationally. Dave is an engaging speaker. He uses humor and stories to challenge and motivate the audience. He is passionate about helping youth become more effective. So put your hands together for... David Rossi. Well, that was uh, quite the introduction. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I guess my, uh, when I'm talking about mentoring or uh, young people and I get asked to speak like this about, uh, <laughs> see, I could norm normally speak louder. Can you hear me now? Can I try again? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so when I get asked about mentoring programs or mentoring young workers, and especially teaching young workers to be safe, I run into a whole bunch of is uh, issues around what mentoring is, how, how do we do it in our community. But if you look around the room at you now, you can notice maybe one thing, and that is how few young people are in the room. And so if you think about yourself in five years or 10 years, Who's going to be sitting at your seat? And what are they going to be thinking? And how are they going to be moving forward? How are they going to be moving the industry forward? How are they going to be taking the knowledge that we have in this room, and how are they going to be moving it forward into the future, the future of Canada? And so really, really important and passionate about helping youth. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. But I'm not going to talk about um, big mentoring programs, per se. Um, not that they're not super important, but I want to talk today about how you can take your skills and your abilities and mentor youth. And so when we talk about mentoring youth, we're not talking about this broad concept. I want to give you practical skills that you can move forward to help yourself and your young workers and the young people in your life move forward. And I don't know what your mentor you look like. Um, like many of you, and I said, I, and you could heard my bio, I've had lots of experience in the industry. My very first job out of school was I was working in a, a forest mill. My father got me the job, ended up working in the Triangle Pacific in Queensboro a lot of years ago. And my mentor at that time was a young man, and it was a totally different culture. And so I was very, very interested in how to work. And so your first job out of school, if you can remember your first job out of school, what it looked like and how it worked. And when you started your first job and you're all nervous about showing up at work and you're supposed to do all these things and you've got all these people that are knowing what's going on, the equipment's moving, and you're, <gasps> and you're trying to figure it all out. And as a young worker, who helped you? Who helped you, and I want you to think about this, who helped you get to where you are today? And if you think about it carefully, not only in your personal life, your family life, but your professional life, how did you get to where you are? And I would think... Most of you have had someone that has made a difference in your life, someone that's affected how you are and how you think and who you are in your world. And so this is the person that you are. And the interesting thing is if you look around as well, you are going to be making a huge difference in someone's life as well. And so in this presentation, if I can affect one person to have a change, so one person can be safe at work through your actions, then we've won. And so this is your task today. And I'm not going to give you um, interesting topics or stats because you'll know them. You look around the room, you can see how few young workers. And we can see the young workers coming into the workforce. And when I work with young workers, they're confused. How do I get to here? 
And so that's our job. We have to get them to where we are now. And so when we move the industry forward, it's going to be further along than where we are. Wouldn't you like to take it to somewhere different? And you can do that through your mentoring. And so mentoring looks in all sorts of different ways. And so when I started in the forest industry, um, I built a sailboat and I sailed to New Zealand. And when I got to New Zealand, I had a job. And someone offered me a job and they said, you're Canadian. Canadians know about logging. Well, of course we do, we're Canadians. And we live in igloos. But if you think about when you got there, they handed me a chainsaw and said, okay, we got this uh, Pinus radiata forest and we need help on it. And you're Canadian, you obviously know how to use a chainsaw. Right? It seems to make sense. Um, and so I've had constant influence or constant work in the forest industry and all sorts of different ways from civil culture to, uh, to the mills to the bush. And so we've got the whole spectrum in there and it's very, very interesting as how I learned. And so when I think about mentoring young workers, what kind of skills do I want to pass on to them? How do I want them to think? And how do I want them to learn? Because I want them to be the very, very best that they can be. And so I'll tell you a little story about my last mentor that I had. Um, here she is here. And this woman, June Osborne, was with the Coldstream Ranch in Vernon. Uh, very, very interesting woman. She taught me about horses. Now, it may not sound like much about forestry, but she was a very, very good mentor. Very kind, very compassionate, always listened to what I wanted to say. And when she moved me forward, she would have this ability to be able to help me think about what I needed to do. And so it was a great lesson and a great mentor to have in my life. And so when I think about mentoring young people, how do I want to be remembered? And what kind of legacy will I leave for my future? Not only with my children, but with my coworkers. And how do I want to do it? The best way of all, we've heard it from some of the other speakers, is to model the behavior. If I'm not modeling good mentoring behavior, how can I expect others to copy and do what I'm doing? So this is my youth and ours. And you may recognize some of these people. Um, they look very similar to the youth of today. And these youth are the youth of the 60s. So I got this picture off a, a website and I found it really interesting because some of the people in it look just like the kids today. And if you think about when we were youth, or some of us were youth, and what did our parents used to say to us, or what did our leaders say? Oh, those youth, they don't know what they're doing. They don't have any common sense. Man, when I was a kid, we had to do this, right? And then, so we faced the same type of situation we run into, and people were saying the same thing about us. Ah, oh, those kids oh, nowadays, and listen to us, we're saying the same thing. Ah, oh, those kids nowadays, they're on their phone all the time, they're texting, they're exactly the same types of words that our parents and our leaders and our mentors were using with us. So how do we move our youth into a leadership position? How do we get them to move forward? And remember, our focus, our focus of what we're trying to do is very, very important. And without that piece in there, we're very stuck, stopped where we are. Because many of us will think, well, we've got to train the youth. We'll give them skills. Uh, we'll teach them how to use a chainsaw. We'll uh, teach them how to drive. We'll teach all these skills to them. But we don't always tell them how to use them. So how to change their thinking around their own safety, their own responsibility. So we've heard one injury is one injury too many. Who do you want to go home to? Who are you going home to? Well, who is your young workers going home to? Um, as I get older, I notice that all the workers are getting younger. Not. Right? I saw a young family the other day and I was like, they look way too young to have a family. And I asked them how old they were and they were in their 20s. And as I get older, they look younger. So our youth are going home to families. And our youth are going home to uh, lives and creating communities around us. And without this ability or without us thinking about we're directly responsible for those youth going home safely with our policies and our procedures, our actions and our behaviors, and how we, our characteristics are, we're responsible for the safety of our youth. And not only that, think about it. Now, if we take that a step further, if we're responsible for the safety of our youth in our workplace, that means we're responsible for the safety of our communities. And how does that play out? 
and how kind of effect, or what kind of effect, can you have on the youth of tomorrow? What are you doing today to influence our community and our future? So um, it's really important that we remember the goal. So a little bit of a myth here. We think about mentoring. Uh, mentoring, you don't have to be green and have a name that rhymes like with soda, like Yoda. We always think of, oh, Yoda is the, the great mentor. Um, anyone that's seen Star Wars, I'm going to assume most of us have. But if you think about it, um, we don't have to look like Yoda. And we don't have to have the same words and speak the weird way that he speaks either. You could all be mentors. The number one tool that you need to be a mentor, number one tool, desire. You have to have the desire to make a change. You have to have the desire to make a difference in someone's life. You have to have the goal that that person wants to go home safe. It's your job to help them. Okay? So anyone can be a mentor. And so this is this, this analogy or this, this big concept that we have that people can't be mentors. Or it's a big process to be a mentor. Or some of the businesses I work with, they say, well, we don't really want to uh, start a mentoring program or some of the employees that I've worked. I don't want to be a mentor. It's too much work. It's too much responsibility. But I'm telling you, you're probably mentoring without knowing it. If you think again, just take a minute. Did anyone influence you in your life that you would call a major influence or a mentor in your life? And you didn't have to talk to them. Um, a political figure, uh, a leader that you've noticed, someone in your community that you tried to copy. There'd be someone in your life somewhere that you took a leader. Now, how do you know that you're not that person? How do you know that you are not the person that are making a big difference in someone's life? today. And so we do it by our actions. We're measured on what we do and how we do it. Our words are important, but more importantly is how we embody the action, how we embody the words. And so very, very important that you have to be, if you take on this role as a mentor, which I would challenge you, as you sit in this room, because your young workers aren't here. They're going to be wanting to be here. They're probably working or at home. They want to come to a conference. I want to be the guy that gets to come to a conference. And I get presents on the table, and I get stuff given to me, and I get free food and coffee. Right? They want to be here, and they're going to be here. How are you going to get them here? And when they sit in your seat, what do you want them to take away from the next conference? And how do you influence them? And it's not hard. It's not hard. It takes practice, and it takes dedication, and it takes focus, so you can move the youth of tomorrow forward. You're responsible, whether you like it or not. So we're going to step up and be mentors. And so my job today, I'm going to try to give you some little bits of wisdom that I've picked up over the years and all the years of mentoring and coaching and things that we've done to help you become more effective mentors in your workplace. So when you go back to work on Monday, you can take a little chunk of knowledge and I'm hoping I can do that for you. Fair enough? So mentoring is this developmental relationship in which a more experienced or knowledgeable person helps a less experienced person. and so. If workers are simply being told what to do, and that is sort of our classic way of doing it, if we can tell people what to do, they comply. Right? You do this, we're going to follow the rules, everybody's happy, especially me, because I made the rules up. And if you follow what I do, I'm feeling pretty good about myself, I'm okay. Right? But they're not necessarily learning. They don't understand the why behind the question. And especially you've heard the uh, generation why. And it's because it sort of happens. Uh, my son's a firefighter. He comes in on uh, Monday morning, and the first thing he has to do is wash the fire trucks. So he asks the chief, why am I washing the fire truck? It hasn't gone out. It's dead clean. And the chief says, well, that's what we do. We always wash the fire truck. And why do you ask so many questions? Right? This is the generation we're working with, this generation that asks why. The why. Why do I have to do that? And 
there's always a reason. Sometimes the problem is we may not know what it is. I don't know what the reason is. We're just, but we always have washed the fire trucks in the morning. Right? We've always done it. Why would I expect it to be any different? That's just the rules, uh, policies that are put in place. And especially in larger companies, we get policies and procedures that are very, very well established and growing continuously. And then we're going to give our new and young workers a safety manual at the beginning of their shift and go, read this. And you're supposed to remember everything you've read and practice all these policies. And you're signing off on it, saying, I understand it. And then out you go to work, and you're supposed to be safe at work. The intervention, the key intervention, is a mentor. Someone that can help you and encourage you and focus you on your task of being safe at work. And sometimes you need that person to connect with. Someone that you can talk to. Someone that you can be coached. And someone that cares enough about you that you will be effective at work. Because you want your young worker or your new worker, and one won't say young is a very uh, vague word, but your new and young worker to be the best that they can be. And how do you know what that is? Hopefully, hopefully, they'll be better than me. If I've done my job properly, they will be better than I am. And maybe they will be able to mentor me. And this is the other part of the equation. These young workers that we're going to be mentoring are going to be mentoring again down the line. They are going to be the next mentors. How are you going to train your next mentors? Because it's easy to say, well, I'm going to train someone to take my job. I can do that. I can teach them all the things I need to know. I can give them all my contacts. But when it comes down to it, when they get to mentor their next employee, what are they going to do? And what kind of techniques are they going to use? And how are they going to make it better? And how are they going to grow our community and grow our industry? How are they going to do it? And without you focusing on this end goal now, you are getting pretty unlucky. It's like um, when I work with parent groups. And parent groups will say uh, to me, uh, you know, I really want my kids to be happy. And just like we can say that about our employees, I really want my employees to be happy. Well, happy is not good enough. Happy is not good enough. We need more than happy. We need focus. We need to make sure that our young people are focused well enough that they cannot just be happy, because just give them happy, give them sugar. Apparently, that works excellent, right? We just want them to, to eat sugar, they'll be happy. But we want more than that. We want them to be healthy. We want our children to have a long-term life where they will make the freedom to make their own decisions in the world. Don't you want that for your children and your workers? Don't you want them to have the freedom they can make their own decisions in the world and pay their way in the community? I think we would probably all agree with that. I would want my children to move out of my house. I don't want them to live with me till they're 50. I want my children to be independent. I want my children to grow up and be, make the world better than I had it, ideally. Just like you would with your workers or your children or the people that you coach. OK, so this is what the mentoring is. So we're talking about giving people the why behind the answer instead of just the rule. Because the generation, the next generation, especially the newer ones, um, have a whole different world than I had. My world is different. I'm trying to learn from them now. And it goes backwards and in circles. And it doesn't stop. So we can easily say, who needs mentoring? This guy needs mentoring. You can see he's uh, not operating his chainsaw in a safe manner. So it's easy to pick out the people that you think need mentoring. Um, interestingly, many times we run into people that you wouldn't think need mentoring that need mentoring, and vice versa. So we can pick this young man, and he totally needs mentoring. Um, you can see that he's uh, not wearing a safety gear, and he's running the chainsaw in an unsafe manner, and so therefore he needs mentoring. But it's not necessarily the case, and you cannot always tell who is the mentee or the protege that you are going to be influencing? In a formal program, we are often coupled, a mentor and a mentee, coupled together, and we create a relationship. But many times, we've picked a leader, or we think an upcoming leader. This guy's going to be really good. We're going to put him in place. And then the leader blows out. 
and we're left with no one. So sometimes you can't tell who they are, who's really going to need the mentoring. It works in businesses, it works in offices, it works in every industry you can think about. You ask most people, most business models, mentoring has been proven to be an effective business model. And most professionals will say the success that they've had through work or through their business life is by the effects of a mentor. And a mentor could be very nebulous, not this one person, I'm a mentor and I'm going to hang it up over my head and I'm going to wear my mentor name tag, therefore I'm a mentor. May not be true. Okay? So I just have to think about this concept that mentoring and mentors can look very different. Not just who you think it is. The wise guy with a white beard or the green guy with the pointy ears doesn't mean necessarily they're the mentors, just like this young man may not be a mentee. Or he may be. So let me give you a few mentoring tips, just to help you out, okay? So when we mentor, and I don't know if anyone's, uh, anyone been to a foreign country? Foreign country, everyone's been to a foreign country at some point. Different language spoken. Um, how hard is it to understand when someone's speaking to you in a foreign language if you don't know the language? It's pretty hard, right? And so I was downtown Vancouver the other day, and there was someone with a language barrier. I think they were from the... Uh, Ukraine, and someone was trying to give them directions. I was in Victoria. And uh, so the person was talking to them. They were asking, I think they were asking how to get to the bathroom or wherever. And the person said, it's over there. And so the person still looking a little confused, so they spoke louder. It's over there. And louder again, it's over there. It's like they didn't hear the first time. So one of the good mentoring tips is you don't have to speak really loudly to be heard probably the delivery or the person's understanding is more important than the loud speaking. So you'll find often when people are mentoring, there's a little mentoring not tip. You don't have to speak really loudly to make your point clear or make yourself heard. Okay? Uh, another one is, uh, the classic is interpretation. Thinking you made sense. If I said to you, think about a dog. Okay, a dog bit me the other day. Now, you could have all sorts of images in your head of what kind of dog bit me. I want you to work really hard. Now, your vision of hard work and my vision of hard work might be quite different, but I told you to work hard. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about, hard work, you know, like uh, six hours a day, half an hour break, hard work. You, you know what I'm talking right? Same, are we on the same page here? Right? You, you got it. You're all nodding your head. Right? That's hard work. Um, how about I want you to get up early for school next day. I want you to focus when you're at work. I want you to be safe on the work site. Right? We've, we've used these words. Right? And they're so unclear and a new and young worker will nod their head because they want to please you. Right? I need you to do this job really well. I need you to do your very best, right? And so the young worker, the new worker will nod their head, yeah, I got it. And they do a job and you're like, what the heck is going on with that guy? Didn't he get it? I told him clearly. Didn't he get it? Right? And maybe, maybe we didn't tell them in the language that they could understand. So when you go back to the workplace, think about when you give directions to someone and you pass on this information about being safe or taking care at work, what does that look like? I want you to eat better. Okay, I want you to eat uh, carbs. I was listening to, the, I'm, I'm really into athletics, and so I listened to, oh, carbs, you know, I'm gonna load up on, how many? Three, five, 10, some? Snack regularly every two hours? How much of a snack? Right, so these are the types of issues that we will run into as mentors that if we're passing the information on to our new and young workers, even though it may be very, very crystal clear to us, it may not be clear to your mentees or the people around you. So even just a quick tip for yourself is check your own language. And when you're giving your language to these people, think about how they're hearing it. So the nice effective way of doing it is I always ask back, how, what do you think I meant by that? and let them tell me. 
And once they tell me, I go, ah, oh, you know, there's a real gap in understanding here. I didn't mean that, I meant this. And it gives you the tools that you need to help yourself and help your young workers. Remember, our goal is not to be right. Our goal is to help our young workers go home safe. That's our goal. And if we're keeping this very, very clear that our young workers need to be going home safe, then that's a different animal. Not about me having policies followed and procedures done. We want our employees to go home safe. And maybe their questions will lead us to greater understanding so we can help our young workers be safe. Maybe me too. Maybe I'll go home safe. OK, so let's, let's go into uh, actually how to do it. And this is, I've spoke a little bit about this piece here. And this works with everything. One other thing is clarity of purpose. If you are absolutely clear to your purpose of what you're hoping to achieve and what your goal is, you're much more likely to get it. Now, this has been done in so many business studies, I won't bother repeating them all here. But if you think about writing your goal down clearly, putting it on a board, then you will know how to get there. You will know what the goal is. My goal is to have you go home safe every day. Now, this is interesting because you think about someone at work, they're going home safe. But at home, uh, substance abuse, uh, abuse, uh, lack of sleep, lack of nutrition. There's a great one, lack of nutrition all the time in the workplace. Well, then they're coming to work, but I want them to go home safe. But I haven't looked at my purpose is to go home safe, which means their life has to be safe enough so when they come to work, they are in a place where they can actually use the tools that they have so they can go home. Otherwise, we're stuck. We're not clear. I just said, go home safe. We haven't looked at the whole picture. We haven't talked about all the other issues that they need to go home safe at work. So being very clear to your purpose. If you are very clear to what you want, you're much more likely to achieve it. So one of the things you're going to work with your new and young workers is understand, they have to understand in their language what being clear to the purpose means. Not my language. My rule. I'm standing here, right? I can make up the rules. They have to understand. Being safe means you have to hydrate properly. It means you need to rest properly. It means you need to focus when you're at work. It means you need to not, maybe not be on your cell phone while you're working so we can stay focused. That's what I mean by safe. Uh, do you understand? Is there questions? Do we have comments around it? But you have to make sure that that goal, very, very clear. It's like a game of rugby. Rugby was developed soccer. I think people were playing uh, football in England. Someone picks up the ball and runs to the line. We've created a new game. That wasn't the original game. The goal changed. Once your focus changes, once your goal changes, without you knowing, we have an issue. So make sure that you and your young workers understand very clearly your goal. This could be around effectiveness in the workplace, effectiveness in the office. You want to make sure that you can achieve your desired result, your goal. OK, uh, we've heard a little bit about this as well, but I'm going to talk about uh, one of the key concepts is independence. And this is the ability to make your own free choices. Now, this seems to work. I'll give you a little example. It seemed to work better with my daughter. It didn't seem to matter so much with my son. But when my daughter started dating, and she would go out into the workplace or out into the bar scene or wherever she was going, and I would be trying to give her all the tools she needed to make sure she made her own independent, safe decisions. So one of the things I told her is, um, darling, when you take your drink, make sure you cover your hands on it when you're out. Make sure you never leave your drink so you don't get it drugged. OK? Got that one. Check. Um, darling, number two, make sure you never go in the car with anyone that's been drinking. OK, that's that one. And darling. Make sure you know who you're going to the party with. OK, that's three. Um, what other ones could I tell my daughter? Oh, right, right, right. Oh, oh honey, make sure that when you go out, um, you're not wearing inappropriate clothes so people take you the wrong way. Uh, what else did I get? Oh, geez, I forgot to tell her about the guy with the tattoo. Oh, forgot about that. Guys with tattoos. Right? So I think I've covered all my bases off. 
But really what I want my daughter to do is we have this ability to make her own decisions on the work site or in her life quickly. Because I can't be there all the time. Ugh. And I forgot to tell her about the guy with the tattoo because one Christmas dinner, I had this guy come over. Um, my daughter brings over for a date and he sits at the Christmas table and he gets up and he says, um, hey, this is his first time we've met him. We're a family dinner. Stands at the Christmas table, he gets up and he says, um, hey, I got a new tattoo. And he's covered with tattoos. So we're all like, oh, well, nice buddy. He goes, do you want to see what my tattoo is? We were like, okay. So he gets up, Christmas table, takes his pants down, and there's a picture of my daughter naked on his thigh. And I didn't tell my daughter about that. Forgot to tell her about those guys. Oh. So, young workers. We can't tell our young workers everything that they need to be safe on the work site. We need to give our young workers the tools that they need to make their own safe decisions because we can't be there all the time. And the way you're going to do it is by mentoring them to be safe on the work site. You are going to have to model the behavior. You are going to have to be clear to your purpose. You're going to have to be consistent in doing what you do so they can copy you. You want them to make their own safe decisions. You want them to make their own decisions like you did. You made your own decisions. If you just imagine, okay, just think about it for a minute. You're going to imagine um, you listen to everything that your mother said. Yeah? Did you listen to everything your mother said? You're probably a rare person. You thought, right? I didn't listen to my, my mother always said, you should have been a teacher. Look it, they got a raise. Right? Should have been a teacher. If you just listened to what they said, you didn't, you made your own decisions in life. And so you're going to expect your young workers, they're going to make their own decisions in life. So how can you lead them to make effective decisions on their own? That's the goal. Because you cannot tell them every hazard on the workplace. You can get lots of them, but you can't get all of them. The only way you're going to be able to do it, the only way you're going to be able to do it is you're going to have to give them the tools to make strong decisions. And what does that look like? Right? So this is part of the concept. You have to teach them that their decisions are their own. And hopefully, they're going to be safe ones. And what does that look like? OK, the classic, keep your head up especially in the, in the forest section. Um, we were out for a hike a little while ago in uh, Lytton, and uh, I've been in the forest a lot, in the woods. And you always see trees falling down in the forest. Anyone's been in the forest, seen their trees falling down, right? And those of us who have worked in the forest may have seen a tree fall down, but I've never seen one fall down, ever. So we're in Lytton, uh, beetle kill, pine forest, the wind comes up. Right beside me, a tree lifts off the ground and crashes down right beside us. And I'm like, holy, now hold it. My mentor told me about not being in the forest in a windstorm. Right? Suddenly, there it is. There's the facts right there. And now I, have, I remember the lesson of what to do, how to do it. But right in front of me, this is my keep your head up. So I've got to start really paying attention to what's going on when I'm in the forest, walking around, because a tree just fell over right beside me. And they do make a sound when they fall in the forest when no one's there, just in case anyone was curious. Um, so one of the things we want to teach people is how to keep your head up. Uh, really, really important. Uh, works with uh, ergonomics and walking. If you walk with your head down, you lose your balance. Walking with our head up, our posture changes. We can start to look where we're going. Anyone coach hockey here? Hockey parents? Come on, there's got to be some hockey coaches in the room. Hockey coaches in the room. If you teach your young players how to play hockey, one of the first lessons we try to teach them is to keep your head up, look around the ice, make sure you can see the plays, don't look down at the puck. A uh, young man here, you can see he was uh, head down, takes a big hit. Right. So this is an easy lesson to teach, you would think. Um, but for young workers, mentoring young workers to be safe in the work site, not only keep your head up physically by when we're walking and when we're looking around, 
but keep your head up so you can keep learning. Ah, that's a different animal. Keep your head up. What opportunities are in the industry right now? Where are we going as leaders in the industry? How do we teach our young workers to keep their head up so they have lots of, they can see the opportunities around us. They can see the hazards. It's changed so much and our industry will continue to change. It will not stay the same. And so those, the young workers that have got their head up and the mentors that have got their head up have got the opportunity to affect positive change in their young workers. Because this is easy. I told you to keep your head up. Like, what do you think? Like, obvious, right? It's not quite so obvious in the work site. Keep your head up. You might have to explain what that means and that it changes. You know, yesterday I was uh, driving down and I saw a deer on the side of the road and I remember like deers jump out on the side of the road, especially at certain times of the day. And you know, I'm always watching for deer when I'm driving, but you know, it's something becomes so common that we become complacent. And so the other part is being open-minded. And this is probably one of the most valuable lessons I can teach people. It's probably one of the hardest lessons to teach people. And it's one of the easiest concepts to misunderstand. Because if someone says, oh, I'm open-minded, everyone eats to their own, that's not what I mean by open-minded. Open-minded means you're looking for the value in other people's points of view. And so to look for the value in other people's points of view, I had to learn computer games. Ugh, I got a stepchild, um, they play computer games, and I had to learn about computer games. Now, I don't really like computer games. I can't imagine ever playing with it, but if I want to talk, start talking to my young students, and they're in this computer game world, I better understand what they're talking about so I can talk to them. Right? Just like, and that is very, very difficult because I don't like it. I actually know what I know. I've been good doing this for a long time and I'm pretty comfortable with everything and I don't really need to be open-minded. Those other, I'm open-minded about, you know, what I want to be open-minded about, but I don't want to be open-minded about things that I don't like, like computer games, like, ooh. Right? Or uh, guys with tattoos on their legs. Or, or, right? So to be open-minded is a super hard challenge. It takes constant diligence, constant attention to be open-minded because how easy it is to get caught in a place that isn't open-minded. Uh, different cultures, really different. My first uh, mill job, um, East Indian. Uh, my whole crew was East Indian. I think I was the only white, white guy working. And that was really different. And so. The food, I didn't like curry. Like, ooh, they're eating curry at dinner, and I'm going, ah, oh, what the heck is this curry? And I'm not open-minded about it, because I like my peanut butter sandwich, I'm good, right? But my boss and all my people around me were East Indian, I have to flip and start paying attention, because I want to learn about them. Curiosity, open-mindedness, looking for the value in other people's points of view, looking for the value very, very difficult to look for value. Easy to make judgments. Looking for value is something very, very difficult. And so that takes work. And it takes us to go, why do I feel the way I do? What can I do differently? And how can I make understand, how can I make my understanding clear? Imagine, ask your young workers a question. What do you do for your time off? What do you, do you play computer games for four or five hours a day? Like, how can you stand that? It drives you nuts. <sighs> Have you ever tried to play one? I never got it. I never realized it was social. It was uh, fun. It, was, it had a whole bunch of other stimuli in there that made it appealing. No wonder they like playing. I never got it. Once I understood it, then I could start to speak the language. Then we can start to affect change. Just like, um, my boss is stupid. He doesn't know anything. Well, my teacher's dumb. My teacher doesn't know anything. Right? You can hear the young, young workers get caught in narrow-mindedness. You imagine them asking you every question. Tell me about yourself. What do you know? How'd you get there? What's your background? How'd you get into the forestry industry? 
what kind of skills? So we were uh, backcountry skiing this year up near Malakwa, and I was uh, on a logging road, and the operator nicely plowed out a spot for me to park our camper. And uh, so I asked him, I said, what do you think the most dangerous change or what the most dangerous uh, issues you're facing in your industry is? Well, when I started to talk to him about these issues, the conversation was great and he made me a great spot after I talked to him. Understanding his point of view was very, very important to him. And I got to learn as well. Now, if your young workers could do that to you, they'd get all that knowledge that's in your head. They're our leaders. So you need to encourage them to be open-minded, but the way to do it is by being open-minded yourself. It works the other way. Another little tip is reinforcing the positive. You've probably heard this lots. Um, well, just look for good things to do. Tell them about good stuff. Hey, good job today. I like your outfit. Oh, man, nice shirt. Uh, yeah, you're really uh, good showing up today on time. And uh, reinforcing the positive, not quite what I'm talking about. Not, remember, we're talking about leaders. What kind of leadership qualities would you like to reinforce? Yeah, I saw the way you were talking to Johnny in the workplace there about his lunch. Yeah, good job. Really appreciate that. Hey, I saw the way that you were uh, checking your car today or checking your truck today. And I saw the way that you spoke to your coworker about the truck check. I appreciate that. Thank you. Because it's important that we all go home safe. These are the reinforcing the pod as we were talking about. Much more in-depth than the superficial, yeah, hey, good job. That doesn't mean much. Right? Looking very carefully at things that they've done right. The things that you think are important to move the leaders forward. That's the reinforcing the positive. You know, when I saw you coaching that hockey team the other day, I really liked the way that you took that little guy aside and talked to him uh, down at his level. You know, I, I really liked how you made eye contact with him. That showed me that you had a good connection with him. That's the type of stuff we're looking for leaders in our company. Oh, well, thank you. That's what we're talking about. So reinforcing the positive is much more than just the flippant, yeah, good job today. Yeah, well, well done. Yeah, good job. Here's a, here's a uh, Starbucks card. Yeah, you did good. Very, very specific. Targeting the behaviors and the characteristics that you want to reinforce. So try it. See how it works. Watch the response you will get from your wards and your young mentees. And it can work. Now, the mentors, you don't have to be a certain age. Here's the other thing. Uh, ideally, you would have more wisdom and you would a long white beard and people would respect you just because you looked a certain way, but you don't have to be a certain age. Young workers can be excellent mentors too. Excellent mentors. And our, some of our young workers can mentor new coming workers into the field and they can make a great connection. So it doesn't have to be just age. And that's the type, remember we're trying to develop leaders. Our goal, clear to your purpose. Remember what your purpose is. Uh, here's sort of the classic that we run into all the time. I run into this. And you can see my spelling is perfect. Being complacent. Lazy thinking. Um, letting things go without really paying attention to them. Well, I'm going to change my diet tomorrow. I'm, I'm training for ski season next week. So I'm going to start next week and start training. Um, ah, you know, maybe I'll wait next week, week after, and I'll start, I'm going to do more push-ups then, and, right? I'm going to start, uh, I'll start coaching next week better. You know, uh, next week I'll get it. Um, you know, he's doing a pretty good job. He, he looks like he's know what he's doing. Like, he's, he looks safe at work. He's okay, or, you know, he, he's fine. And as soon as we become complacent, we let it slip. Now, if you can think about a bad relationship somewhere in our lives, um, we probably somewhere let it slide. Somewhere it became complacent. We didn't focus. Our goal was lost. If our goal is to keep our young workers safe, then we cannot be complacent, ever. Constant diligence. Constant focus. We have to be focused. If we cannot be focused, if we get complacent or lazy with our coaching, our mentoring, then we are running in the danger of letting the relationship slip and accidents happen. Complacency. 
not checking our equipment regularly, um, all the other ones you can think about. Right? Really, really easy to do. Really, really easy to let it slip. If you want to stay diligent and focused, like a top athlete, a top athlete, they are not complacent. If you want to be at the top of your game, no matter what it is, you are going to be very diligent in how and where you do. How and what you do. Without that piece in there, you become complacent. And as soon as that happens, you run the danger of the relationship falling, accidents seeping in at the bottom because we become focused on different topics. Okay, one of the classics, this is one I've spoke to many, many groups around uh, creating a sense of belonging or a sense of place. Ideally, our sense of place looks like a castle. Uh, it may feel like a castle. Uh, we want this place to be safe, a uh, place that where our young workers can speak freely to us, a uh, place where we can exchange ideas without fear of recrimination, uh, without fear of punishment. Um, you know those stupid questions that people ask? The really stupid ones, like, you know, like, uh, why are we doing this anyhow? Or um, those types of questions, freely asked without fear of recrimination. Uh, so to create a sense of place is the key component that you can share the information. Now, it doesn't have to look like a castle. It may look like this. It may look like the back of your pickup truck. It may look like the inside of the cab of your car. It may look like your office. It may look like your uh, outside on the lawn. It may look somewhere, anywhere, but you are going to create, you, you are going to create the safe place. You're going to create a place where your mentees can freely share, and you can discuss broad concepts to bring understanding, to create open-mindedness, where you can model the behavior that you want your young workers to have. You want to create the sense of place where they can freely come without fear. And once you take away the fear, fear of failure, uh, fear of being stupid, fear of uh, being judged, fear of whatever, and you remove that fear and you make it a place where they can freely share, then you have the ability to be able to affect positive change very quickly. And this is vital. And if you work with um, uh, youth programs, a lot of the high-risk youth uh, have had no place to feel a whole place of sense of place. Uh, schools don't always do it. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, but you'll find most of the youth programs will have some place where the youth can come and feel safe. Uh, there'll be, could be food provided, food's a good one. Make it comfortable, people like to eat and share. Uh, the lunchroom's a great place. They have to feel safe. Not to say something dumb and get fired for it or punished for it. They have to be able to come and say something dumb and be coached and corrected and mentored because you want them to be leaders. You want them to go home safe. You want them to be awesome. And you are awesome, so why can't you change them? You need to help them be awesome too, like you. You want them to be awesome. So we're going to need to do it. We need to have a safe place where they can talk to us. So think about when we say, when someone will say something to us and you'll go, well, that, that's dumb. Or you're thinking, God, this guy's a, oh, oh, how can he say that? Then we've gone to that place ourselves. We're judging. The safe place is open discussion so they can discuss the issues freely so we can share with each other. And then you can move them forward or give them the ideas. You know, I've had that issue. I remember when I was young and I did that. I've got a big scar on my knee from a chainsaw. No one showed me how to use a chainsaw. I wish they did. So the mentors, you can actually mentor bad behavior. So when we think of mentors, you can have evil mentors. We don't want to be an evil mentor. We want to make sure that our workers go home safe with the tools that they need and the information that they have to be effective so they can achieve the desired result, so they can have a long, full life, so they can be part of the community. They'll grow our community, grow our industry because they will shape Canada. They will shape the future. And we are going to see more and more young workers coming into the workforce. 
it's going to be a dramatic change. In the next 10 years, we are going to have a dramatic shift in the workplace. And what are you doing to prepare Canada? Or are you just throwing up your hands and go, well, that's going to be their problem? What are you going to do with all your knowledge and all your skill and all your wisdom? What are you going to do with it? Are you just going to let it go? What about the people that mentored you to get where you are? Are you going to let them down as well? Or are you going to take the challenge and shape Canada? Are you going to take the challenge and shape your industry and move it forward? So, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? Because if you think about it, the le you are going to leave the legacy today for the youth of tomorrow. You are going to have an influence shaping the future. So if I can recap, to quickly go back over it. Anyone can be a mentor, takes desire. Right? Anyone can be a mentor, takes desire. A couple of tips to do it. Open-minded, not be complacent, and focus on your goal. Keep your purpose clear, clear to your purpose. The clearer you are to the purpose, the more likely you will be able to achieve your results. And what are you going to do today to shape the legacy of Canada and your industry for tomorrow? And that's my presentation. And I really hope that you can take some of what I said, and I know some of the concepts seem broad or big, but you make such a difference. And if you can think about uh, coaching young people or the young students in your life or uh, young team players or people, anyone in the community and how you are behaving and how you're acting and what are the young people and the young workers taking away from this? And how do they get there? How did you get there? Thank you. Has anyone got questions or would anyone like comments? Anyone got a comment about a mentor? Someone they could bring an example of a mentor in their life that made a difference or no questions? Come on, gotta have some questions. That's all right. Yes, absolutely. And I think we can uh, attribute that. So the question was, uh, have we seen any changes in the workers, uh, the past generation or the past workers to the new workers of today and the supervisor, the challenge facing the supervisor today? Would that sum your question? Um, let me share a little story with you. Um, I've got a son-in-law that works as a consultant on the rigs. Um, so they are starting to look at young worker training programs. Uh, the reason they were is they've been having complaints around abuse on the work site. And the deal was, um, in, in the rigs, or on the, and this is many, many industries, it started out with almost a bullying mentality. You're going to do what I say, you're going to suck it up, you've got to be tough to be in this industry, and this is the way we did it. And so, um, cell phone. Young guy records the conversation from the supervisor, and flips the message to mum, mum's on the phone to head office with the message. Next thing, supervisors got the call back and suddenly we're into this whole different scenario where now the supervisor's been uh, disciplined for abuse. Really interesting. And so this is happening more and more regularly because what we're seeing is a new or younger generation, never, we've never experienced a war, a major war in Canada. Uh, we've been uh, enabled or um, in a very comfortable place where we've been sitting at. So when we get into a situation like that, um, we do have to modify our delivery to the young worker because this young worker has been told they are worth it. They're valuable without ever having to prove it. 
So you knew your previous generations usually had to sort of work or seem to work a little more up. The younger generation, the new generation now, they're entitled to this belief that they are going to be worth it, their value, without proving it. So our job as supervisors, so thank you for the excellent question, our job as supervisors is to teach or coach and mentor these young workers the way of the workforce. And you know what, it might change dramatically, but it's a big issue facing <laughs> young workers today. They've come into it, they're coming into an industry with this feeling of that they're, gonna, they're valuable, they've got some entitlement, how do we move them past that? Education, education and mentoring, and being in a safe place where you can talk to them freely without this, uh, to change their education, to change the training, because the schools aren't doing it, and our education system is falling on it, so it's up to us as the supervisors and mentors to be able to coach our young workers so they can move the industry forward. And a great question I'd like to do, to do that is, if you were in my position, what would you tell yourself? How would you get yourself to move forward? And that usually starts to get their brain to go, oh, like why was that? So do you think that would be reasonable if you came in late every day and that would be, would you, would you consider that fair? Like if you were in me, what would you do? And so that looks from the value in their point of view. And by asking them questions around, so do you do this at home normally? So at school did it work? At, and so by encouraging these open questions, you can help them understand their point of view and help them at that point understand yours. And I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Great question, thank you. Uh, so the question was, uh, how do we stop sounding like a policeman and more like a mentor? And so this is what I, when I spoke about independent, this ability to make your own free choices. And so really important that we understand that we're not here, it's not a punitive model. If you don't do this, we're gonna do that. If you don't do that, we're gonna, right? And we become like a police force. Uh, it's not the purpose of a mentor. A mentor is to help that young worker become more effective at what they're doing. And to do that by open-ended questions helps that thing we call cognitive dissonance, to be able to create a question in our head where we go, oh, that was a good question. Why did I do that? Or why didn't I? So instead of just, this is the policies and procedures, you better follow the policies and procedures or this is gonna happen, there'll be a reason they didn't. And so to avoid sounding like a policeman would be to ask the questions of the young worker of the why behind it. And once you can understand that why behind the piece, you will find that from then, you can start to get their point of view. Once you get their point of view, you can start to insert yours, right? Because otherwise, you're gonna be too stuck. Well, I told you not to do that, that's, um, think about your children. Most of us, I think many of us have children. Um, and we want them to do something. Well, I told you you can't have that after dinner. You can't have dessert before dinner. Why? Well, because it's just not, you don't eat dessert before dinner. Right? It doesn't really give them the reason behind it. If we started to understand the whole um, physics behind nutrition, they understood it, then they can start to make their own decisions around what happened and how it feels. So when you made a decision like that, what happened the last time? Ah, you know, I got, I got in trouble, or this is what happened, or I lost my job, or I had a safety issue, or I got written up, or, right? So then did you like that result? Was that something you were looking for? Or was it something you were trying to avoid? Oh, you know, uh, I was trying to avoid it, and this is what happened, and so then you've created an opportunity to learn. But if you are the policeman, you are a figure of authority, yet it's very hard to move from that point to a point of open discussion. So it's hard to step back, and I would do it by asking them questions around how they are and what they're thinking. And so that would drive the responses to help them move. Remember, you want them to make your own decisions. Think of my story with my daughter. I forgot to tell her about guys with tattoos. Right? Darn it. But honey, I told you not to bring, oh, I forgot that one question. Forgot to ask her about guys with tattoos on their leg. Uh, shoot. I, got, I think I got all the other ones, but, right? So you want them to make their own decisions. And by coaching and mentoring them, that's what you're driving them towards doing. Them to go home safe. Thank you.